But if you would like one of those as well, they're just here in the tub, so you're very welcome to, to grab one of those. How, can, how about I pray for us? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are the God who speaks. We thank you that the God, you are the God who, who wants to, to change us more and more into the image of Jesus. God, as we open your word, we pray that you would encourage us, that you would inspire us, that you would reshape our hearts and our lives, that we might reflect a little more of Jesus. And we ask it in his name. Amen. How is everyone? Still awake? It's hot. I had to roll up my sleeves. Um, it's good to be with you. And as we get underway this morning, I wanted to take you on a little bit of a journey to an exotic place, a, a journey to Belgium, uh, where after travelling down these narrow uh, garden tracks through the apple and pear fields, as you can see on the screen, in the region of Bogloon, you emerge at this remarkable piece of art. This remarkable piece of art called Reading Between the Lines. Reading Between the Lines is a sculpture that has been created by a couple of architects, so a little bit like you, John Gaddup, <laughs> um, seeking to bring art into the public space and help us to look at our surroundings a little differently. And this particular sculpture is a sculpture of a church. Uh, this church has been modelled on the churches in the area, but it has one distinct difference, as you can see. It is transparent. And maybe you think a transparent church, well, that can't really exist. It's no church at all. But as you look at this photo, you can see this church exists and it is built from 100 layers of steel plate stacked to create this model church that stands 10 metres tall and weighs over 30 tonnes. But depending, the interesting thing about this uh, sculpture is depending where you stand, it can look, one, like a, a solid structure, or as you move around, it seems to dissolve into the landscape, creating this optical illusion. And as you walk around, there is actually one point, and you can see the steeple in the background, there is one particular angle where the steeple of the local parish fits perfectly into the spire of this model church. It's quite an incredible sculpture, isn't it? And it's captured my imagination for a number of years because it serves in many ways as a prophetic image for the church, particularly the way we engage with the world around us. The desire of the architects was to, to create this greater transparency and connection between what happens inside the church and what happens outside the life we live in a community around us. You know, it's all well and good, isn't it, to come on a Sunday morning and to worship together, but the challenge is how does this how does the life and the character of Jesus and our patterns for worship infiltrate our everyday lives? As Romans says, our ordinary sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around lives. Because in many senses, that's what Paul is encouraging the believers in Thessalonica for. Not that they have continued to gather and meet in the synagogue, but because their love and their commitment to Jesus has completely transformed them every part of their lives such that more than a community defined by a certain building or religious traditions, he commends them for living as people of faith, hope and love. I mentioned two weeks ago, Thessalonica is one of the few ancient cities that still exists, that is still alive and well today. But back in its time, back in Paul's time, it was the second largest city in Macedonia. It was second only to Athens, a little bit like uh, Melbourne to Sydney, although Melbourne has overtaken Sydney. It was a centre for trade and development, so people from all the, the local areas would come in and, and trade goods. And so it was a multicultural, had a strong multicultural influence. The religious beliefs and cultures and practices all converged in the marketplace. And so Acts 17, Paul and, and Silas and Timothy, as we heard, arrive in Thessalonica. And after three days of teaching in the synagogue, three weeks of reasoning from Jason's home, Paul convinces people that Jesus is the Messiah. He shows them why uh, Jesus had to suffer and rise from the dead. And as a result, this uh, number of uh, Jews and a large number of Greeks, otherwise known as God-fearers, people who uh, feared God, the, the God of the Old Testament, but hadn't gone through all the rituals of Jewish people. And these women, these women who were leaders in their community, they all come to faith in Jesus. 
The Jewish leaders start to feel a little threatened and so like any good mafia figure, they uh, gather some troublemakers, the rebel from the marketplace and they start a riot in the streets. They start dragging the Christians out of their homes and in front of the courts and yet even in the midst of this hardship, these new believers remained strong. Uh, they end up hiding Paul and Silas and sending them off in the middle of the night, not so much to save their lives as I would be hoping for, but so their mission can continue in the surrounding cities. And yet despite all this hostility, this fledgling church, under the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, it continues to thrive. It gets held up by Paul as the model church. It's been a year since Paul left Thessalonica. And he writes this letter. It's the first letter he's written to any of the churches. And the way he writes it, you can sense, can't you? There is this, the the people of this church hold a special place in his heart. And most of all, in the heart of God. He introduces this letter, or the the people in this letter, he introduces as being them in the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a model church. It's not a perfect church by any means. Remember the saying, if you happen to find a perfect church, don't go because you'll screw it up. It's not a perfect church by any means. But it's a good church. It's a flourishing church, a church that Paul holds up as a model to believers right across Macedonia. It's a church that he holds up as a model for you and I. Because despite their circumstances and all the hostility and hardship they have faced, they continue to be a community, a people marked by faith, hope and love. And that's how Paul begins in verse 2. We always thank God for you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before God our Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul commends them for. It's what makes them a model church. And these are the things that I believe God wants to keep growing in us here at Campbell Baptist. A faith, a faith that works. A love that labours. And this hope in Jesus that endures, no matter what life throws at us. If you've got a Bible, you can join me in the first chapter of Thessalonians, where the first thing Paul commends this church for, the first thing that makes it a model for us, is a faith that works. He wants to encourage in us a faith that works. Now, now as Christians, often we hear those words, don't we? Faith and works, and we go into overdrive this, uh, automatically get drawn into these theological discussions about which happens first, faith or works, and how do they work together? It's not uh, works to earn our faith. But what Paul is talking about here in this moment It's the kind of faith that is effective, the kind of faith that changes us from the inside out. That's why he goes on to explain how faith comes and and what it does within us. If you notice what Paul says, verse verse 4, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Faith, according to Paul, is the action of God. It's something he initiates, something he brings into life through the Holy Spirit, through the speaking of his word and through the power of the Spirit. And he highlights the response. The response he received in Thessalonica was one of deep conviction. And this deep conviction is what causes this change in their affections, this realignment in their direction, such that verse 9, Paul says, they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And when it comes to this kind of a change in affection and direction, sometimes in our safe, middle-class existence, it's so easy, isn't it, to take Jesus for granted. It's so easy, even though we come to faith, to continually following the patterns and the passions of this world, the, the gods of this age. Sure, we might not have physical idols of statues made of stone and, and wood and, and gold, The whole of Western society is based and shaped on this pattern of idolatry. The sense of looking to find our identity, our purpose, our satisfaction in anything and everything other than God. And so far too often without realising we find our attention and affections have moved from Jesus. And onto the gods of this world, the gods of money and power and sex. What's the saying? Money 
makes the world go round. And so in order to be a part of this world, we need money. And money can be a good thing used for wonderful purposes, but far too often, if you're anything like me, we can start to love money and the comfort it affords. We find ourselves wanting that little bit more instead of being content with what we have. Power, as much as it corrupts, and absolute power, absolutely, we all want that little bit more power. We all want this autonomy in order to gain this elusive gift of freedom where no one can tell us what to do and how to live. And then there's the issue of sex and, and relationships, finding that perfect somebody to complete us. Such that it has become the thing that defines who we are. Instead of the fact we are made by God, made in his image, made wonderful in his sight. Now constantly we are surrounded by all these pressures and expectations to conform to the patterns of this world. And yet faith that works is the kind of faith that overtakes our affections and changes our direction, helping us turn away from those things that are unhealthy and ungodly and unhelpful. So we can be transformed again and again into the image of Jesus. So we can learn to live in the patterns of his kingdom. And as I thought about this for myself and our church, I can't help but wonder if we, what we are missing at times is this deep conviction that Paul speaks about. This absolute passion and commitment to Jesus that runs so deep in our hearts. It stirs our affections. And moves us to dig deeper into his word, to experience more of his spirit's presence and power. Because that is what makes faith work. It's not what we do. It's what God is doing in us and through us. It's what it means to follow Jesus. And I wonder if that's where my heart, if that's where our hearts are this morning. We have this deep conviction Not only that Jesus is the Son of God, the one who died for the sins of the world, but there's an unwavering commitment to turn away from the patterns of this world and follow Jesus. To live every moment, every day, for the rest of our lives, seeking to see the patterns of his kingdom established in our hearts and in our homes and in our workplaces, our universities, to see the kingdom of God come on earth as in heaven. That's what it means, a faith that works. That's what Paul celebrates about this church and holds it up as a model for generations to come. This unwavering faith in Jesus that is constantly transforming us into his image. And then he goes on to highlight one of the significant characteristics of this kind of faith brings in us. Namely, love. It's his second observation, a labor of love. And when it comes to love, Paul's already highlighted, hadn't he, where love comes from. He says, verse 4, they are loved by God. That's where love starts. It always starts with God because God is love. And so whether it's a result of being made in the image of God, as broken as we are, or a result of our relationship with Jesus, love comes from God. And this love is meant to be worked out in the way we engage with the world and the people around us, both inside the church and outside the church. That's why Paul points to his example, to his love. Verse 5, you know how we lived among you for your sake. He's saying, you know how we lived, how we loved you. You became imitators of us and the Lord. And then he goes on to show how this love impacts both inside and out the church. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the, the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia, Achaia, and the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith has become known everywhere. It's pretty wide-reaching, isn't it? And when it comes to love, remember the command Jesus gives his disciples shortly after he had pulled on this apron and washed his disciples' feet, shortly after he announces that, that Judas uh, would betray him and, and Peter deny him. In this moment when everything seems to be pulling apart, he gives his disciples this new command, a new command I give 
to you. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now, the first part of this is to love one another, to love each other in the church as fellow believers. That's how we become an example and a model for those around us. And when it comes to love, society has taught us often that if you don't fully agree with me, if you can't embrace me completely, you don't really love me. In fact, you're the enemy. And, and far too often we see this same mindset creep into the church. Biblically, we already know that, that love transcends everything. Love transcends unity of belief. And to get an unbiased opinion, I actually plugged this into one of those new AI apps, uh, ChatGPT. Does love require the same beliefs? And even uh, artificial intelligence says that to require a unity of belief across all the important issues of life would be impossible, if not unworkable, definition of love. And so even on a secular level, love isn't about uniformity. It's about having the grace to put aside our differences. And more so, true love is, regardless of our differences, being willing to have attitudes and actions and a life of service towards those who are different than ourselves. It can be hard sometimes, isn't it? It can be hard to love one another in the church and across denominations when we have so much in common and yet the call, this call to love one another in the church is about helping us lay the foundations in preparation for us to love and serve those around us, to be a witness to our wider community. I was talking with someone the other week, we were chatting uh, uh, away and when they, they found out I was a, a pastor, they started sharing some of their experiences growing up in the church. Experiences of being judged and abused. And so they'd walked away from the church altogether. <clears throat> it's heartbreaking, isn't it? <clears throat> it breaks my heart. It breaks the heart of God that there is an increasing number of people who will never set foot inside the church because of our inability not only to love one another in the church, but to love those beyond the church. And yet John 3.16 tells us that Jesus came in love, for God so loved. John 3.17 tells us that he came <clears throat> to save and not to judge. So we need to take up this same posture of humility. So we can love and serve those around us because we have become far too accustomed at times to calling the shots. Far too used to chafing society from the top, we say, and everyone needs to follow what we say. The church, when it has power, a power is never meant to have, seeks to influence from the top. A church filled with the love of God seeks to serve and bless those around us. And that is my sense about how God is calling us to live in this season and as we move forward to be willing to humble ourselves, to get our hands dirty, to labour with love as we serve those around us, to be generous with our time and our energy and our resources, and most of all, as we do, to continue pointing people to Jesus in word and action. Because he is the greatest expression of love that we can give. That's what Paul affirms about this church in Thessalonica. He affirms this faith that works, that the way they laboured together with love. And it made them an example to all believers and to us ourselves today as the gospel continued to spread. This is the feedback he has heard. And I have to admit, that's what I see happening in our community. Earlier this week, I sat down at Munro Street to a meeting with 10 people, 10 people from all the various health and health and housing organisations that manage the community in Munro Street. And they were looking at how things could move forward, what they could do to benefit the community, and every time they wanted to know what was going on, they looked to me. They looked to us as a church. They asked about the lunches we run because we are the only ones who are hands-on in this community. We are the only ones who are loving and serving people on the ground, even those who are a little challenging. And this love, this willingness to serve, 
is what earns us trust and respect. It's what earns us a right to be heard, even from government departments. We need to love each other. We need to love our friends and neighbours. We need to reflect the, the patterns of Jesus and his kingdom because as we do, when we're welcome and, and even when we're abused a little, that's when we will have an impact, not only in this present moment, but an impact for eternity. And that's a perspective we need to maintain. We need a faith that works, we need a, a love that labours, and we need, most importantly, this unwavering hope in Jesus. It's our third and our final observation. In being a model church, there is this unwavering hope in Jesus. One of the interesting things about these two letters uh, to the church in Thessalonica is that every chapter, every chapter ends with a reference to the coming of the Lord. I had to check it myself after I read it, and it's true, it does. And at the end of chapter 1, verse 10, the testimony received about the believers is not only that they had turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, but they were continuing to wait for the great hope that Jesus had promised in his return. They continued, it says, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. It's interesting to note, isn't it, when Paul talks about the end times, he looks back to the resurrection of Jesus. He looks back to the, the beginning of the church. He looks back to the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Because this is the beginning of the last days. I don't know about you, but when I'm having a lousy day, when everything's going wrong, there's a difficult conversation to have or a challenging decision to make. I often find myself hoping and praying that Jesus will return. Have you ever done that? <laughs> if you can just return now, it would save me a whole lot of heartache. It still hasn't happened yet. I'm glad there's some others. And yet that's where we find the Thessalonian believers are different. They were being persecuted for their faith in Jesus. They were facing incredible hardship and, and this hope in Jesus... It gave them something to look forward to. They were enduring and they were expectant. And yet what we do find is that this uh, desire for Jesus' return had distracted them from what they were meant to be doing. In chapter 5, they become idle. And we far too often, we as a church, have wrestled with this same challenge, generation after generation. I'm not sure, has anyone seen the movie Bruce Almighty, Jim Carrey? Jim Carrey had, uh, I can't remember his name in the movie, after all his complaining. Because he can run the world better than God can. He gets to be God for the day. And as he seeks to be God for the day, working everything to his advantage and, and everyone else's. So everyone who prays gets exactly what they want, everything they want. And, and everything in the world goes horribly wrong. And the world starts coming undone. undone and you have this crazy haired homeless guy in the background with his banner declaring the end of the world is near. The people remember him, this crazy homeless guy. And you know this is the stereotypical idea, isn't it? The end of the world is near, this crazy guy with his A-frame sandwich board uh, declaring. And yet what turns out to be a stroke of genius in Bruce Almighty is that this crazy guy, end times prophet, Walking around wearing this banner, the end of the world is near, is God himself. At least Morgan Freeman playing God in the movie. You see, when it comes to the turn of Jesus, only God himself knows. And as much as Christians have tried to predict when Jesus will return with the introduction of barcodes at the, the turn of the year 2000 or even with COVID, don't get me wrong, signs seem to be increasing. But our place is not to predict when Jesus comes. Our place is to be prepared any and every moment. You know that saying that some people are so heavenly minded they are of no earthly value? I have to think, I have to say I'm yet to meet the people who fit in this category. Because more often than not, the problem is we get so focused on earthly 
things, that we neglect our heavenly calling. We lose sight of the promise of Jesus' return, this sense of urgency it is meant to to stir up within us. I mean, it's been over 2,000 years and we're still waiting, aren't we? And yet, like the Thessalonian believers, we need to hold this hope of Jesus' return close to our hearts, knowing that one day, The world will be judged. One day God's wrath will be revealed. One day our lives will be restored and his kingdom will be established. And this is the promise that helps guide us through every day of our lives. It helps us live with purpose. It helps us to make the most of every opportunity to share Jesus. Because who knows, today could be our last. None of us know what tomorrow holds. None of us know when our lives might be taken. None of us know when Jesus is coming. And yet the good news is that the hope that Jesus gives will help us endure hardship. It will help us stand firm in the face of suffering. It will help us keep following and pointing people to Jesus until the day that he comes. And our world is completely transformed. Our place is to hold on to this hope. That one day we will see Jesus return and his kingdom established on earth as in heaven. And as I read this chapter again, it it struck me. This first chapter of Thessalonians. One of the key themes that Paul alludes to is this pattern of modeling or imitation. When it comes to modelling, you need two things, don't you? You need a model and an imitator. We've had those moments with the girls where they imitate each other, even just yesterday. Sometimes it's a bit of fun, isn't it? They make every word and every action of their siblings. And other times it's not greatly appreciated, to say the least. We're getting to that stage, maybe as teenagers, some of those words and actions might come back to, to haunt me. But imitation, for the most part, is a good thing. It's one of the ways we learn and we grow. It's one of the ways we discover new patterns and behaviours. And that's what Paul is talking about in this greeting to the Thessalonian church. This pattern of modelling. That's what Paul sought to do through his mission and his witness, to be a model worthy of imitation. And that's what he commends this church in Thessalonica for, for imitating his life and his faith. Such that the believers in different churches and across the region, and most of all, those who yet to, uh, yet to come to know Jesus, to anyone watching, will see their example. Their example of faith, hope, and love. And the same is true for us today. God is calling us to be models. Not perfect models, thank God. Jesus is the only perfect model, but living models who reflect something of the faith and the hope and the love that Jesus has given. We need a faith that works. We need to model a love that labors. We need to model a hope that endures through all the ups and downs of life. We need to live as a people of faith, hope and love because that is what our community needs. That is what our world needs. That is what the church needs today more than anything. Not another service, not another gathering, not another religious tradition, but people of God. Followers of Jesus who will live with faith, hope and love. You and me who choose to live The faith that works continues to reshape us into the image of Jesus. The love that moves us to work for the good of those around us and point them to Jesus. With a hope that no matter what this world throws at us, is unwavering and steadfast in the promises of Jesus. we go from here this morning, I want to encourage us to consider what it might mean for you at home, at work, 
with friends and with family, with co-workers and friends on the uni campus to consider what it might mean to reveal the hope, that the love, the faith and the love and the hope that Jesus gives. To live with it, to share it. That people might see something of the beauty and the wonder of Jesus. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this church. So many generations ago, but this church that has so much to say to us. God, in a fallen and broken world, we ask that you would challenge us and you would encourage us and by your spirit you would shape us to be so much more than a group who gather on a Sunday morning. That you would call us again, that you would stir in our hearts a longing to live as people of faith, hope and love. People who know and are committed to living after Jesus. People who love boldly, bravely, unconditionally those around us, seeking to point others to Jesus. People who live with the hope that is unshakable and unbreakable because you have promised Jesus is coming and you are faithful. God, teach us again what it means to be the church. Teach us what it means to live with faith, hope, and love. So we might see, like this church, others around us encouraged and the witness of Jesus expanded and your kingdom come in us and through us and around us. For the glory of Jesus, we ask in his name. Amen.